so I'm Jamie Rylands. I'm a pulmonologist trained in the UK, uh, now based in Malawi, running the Lung Health Unit of the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Trust. And I did my PhD in household air pollution. But if I told you the title, you would fall asleep. It was about glutathione peroxidase, antioxidant buffering in the lung, how particulates exerted biochemical effects. No PhD has ever changed the world, I think, and mine is no exception. But it's, I'm going to try and take you on the same journey I have from the realisation that, firstly, air pollution and air quality is important. Secondly, that we can do research looking at biochemical effects. But thirdly, that we probably shouldn't, and we need to move to something action. And this has come up time and again, without really being said over the last day or two. Fire has been our friend. Very frequently, it's a very integral part of life. It's a part of family life, it's a part of nutrition, it gives security, it gives warmth. It's been a positive force. And undoing some of that will be difficult for a lot of behavioural reasons. You have nyama choma, nyama osa choma in Chichewa, not cooked meat, it's not as good. So you have to cook and you have to use energy. The question is how you use it and how we impart knowledge to people that need to. And this was shown yesterday, um, I'm not sure whose slide came first, but this was from 2008. Um, and this is where people use electricity. You don't go into a house in Blantyre in Malawi of the middle classes and see kerosene lamps being used. You see them put electricity bulbs in and use electricity. And where people have electricity, they use it. And electricity generally is a relatively clean energy source. But of course, we're talking about where there isn't electricity and where there is use of biomass fuel for household air pollution. So, bad, I'm going to talk to you about a lot of things that are very, very obvious. Bad air quality is bad, but what's good air quality? We haven't mentioned ambient air pollution, and I would challenge you to move away from the concept of household air pollution. If you see something smoking, it is bad for you. It's bad for your health. But if we rely on health outcomes as the driver of change, we have already failed. So I'm talking to the wrong audience. We need to be talking to public health, to government, to policymakers, in order that we reduce wholesale our exposure to particulates. And household air pollution is important, but it's not the only one. If you reduce particulates, and you can do it on a mass basis in cleaner air, you can improve life expectancy and it affects everybody. This is uh, perhaps slightly outdated EPA advice in the US now showing about unhealthy levels of particulate matter. And I'm going to talk about PM2.5, the small 2.5 microgram diameter of air pollution. Above 65 unhealthy and you need to take mitigating action, particularly if you have chronic respiratory or other diseases. There's not much ambient air quality monitoring done in Africa, but that which is being done, look at the red here, the PM2.5, is when you look at a weighted average, relatively lower than Beijing, for example, not to say it's good, because any reduction is good. Then. We have problems of monitoring at uh, national level, and we have problems of monitoring at individual level. And we've talked, and Rebecca has talked, about how they intend to monitor personal exposure to particulate matters. I'm going to show you three graphs which you can't see, but the two at the top, on the left hand side is particulate matter, and on the right is carbon monoxide. And if you take an individual and you do the same measurement on two days running, they correlate very well. Particulate matter correlates with particulate matter in the same person very well. Same for carbon monoxide, but they don't measure the same thing. They don't correlate very well when you don't put them together. So we have measurement problems. But we also have uh, a, a cue to action. We know, and you've seen these kind of graphs before, that someone lights a Gico, Baula, some sort of cooking stove, um, and uh, you see very high levels of particulates around that time. But two things. One, the area under the curve is actually relatively small compared to some of the more ambient particulate matter. Uh, and two, there is very, very high levels. And we know this from lots of places. I'm going to show you data from my 
uh, favourite sub-Saharan country, African country, Malawi, um, but others are available. And you can see that rural areas do have higher exposures in the home to particulate matter and PM2.5 being the two boxes on the left. And that's frequently well above what the EPA would say is dangerous. But focusing on household air pollution, this is Majid Azati's data from Kenya in 2001. And he showed a nice dose-dependent relationship on particulate matter as measured or modelled in rural Kenya and accessing treatment for lower respiratory tract infection in children on the left and in adults on the right. But look at the numbers that were assessed here. 93 children, 229 adults, and these have not really been replicated. I'm not suggesting we should. My overall message to this is that we have enough data that smoke is bad and we need to think about what to do. Does smoke cause some of the obstructive um, problems we see? We know smoking does. And if you take Cape Town, there's both exposures, this is the bold survey data, there's obstruction related to smoking, there's obstruction probably related to household air pollution and lots of other data. There's emerging data and stuff that's already been talked about in terms of the fresh air study with high rates of obstruction in Uganda, higher in females, but different patterns in different sub-Saharan African countries and different patterns if you use different reference ranges. So we know there's respiratory problems in adults. The question is, are they attributable to household air pollution? And the answer is, I don't care. If it smokes, it's bad and you need to reduce it. We know that childhood lung function, if you take people in older life, age 45 on the right, and you know their lung function from previously, you can see that had you known their lung function at seven years old, you would have been able to predict whether they had this COPD asthma overlap a good few years later. And it speaks to what's already been uh, said, that early life events are really important. Secondly, that, house, that, that um, uh, poor lung function is not just a respiratory illness. So uh, here, I think the data from the Netherlands published in the uh, uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine two years ago. And if you have um, FEV1 that's worsening, you have other associated symptoms. You have uh, cardiovascular disease, you have diabetes. And so thinking through the prism of lung health might not be exactly where we want to go. We want to make people more healthy. FEV1 might be an indicator, but it's not the only problem. And this slide is just going to illustrate how I think some research now at an epidemiological level is uh, slightly unhelpful. Two papers uh, in the same journal, the blue journal, uh, at the tail end of last year. One says household air pollution is associated with COPD. The bottom one, Pete Burney's uh, CO, um, uh, bowl survey, says it isn't. Well, we know, I opened saying air quality was important, smoke is bad. I don't think we need to argue about whether um, air pollution causes COPD. And partly this comes from a jaded view I have now of the interventions which we've tried and have not worked. In Guatemala, putting a stove in, you didn't reduce the primary endpoint of uh, pneumonia in young children. Although it might be that the stoves weren't used well, and where you did look, where you, they were used, where you did reduce particulates, there was a signal. In Malawi, the cooking and pneumonia study, we cluster randomised people to have an improved cook stove which should reduce particulates by 90%, those that are burnt for cooking use. And we did not, in 10,000 children, reduce IMCI diagnosed pneumonia. We did reduce burns, importantly, and that's, that's an important thing. Um, but we didn't get the signal we wanted, and graphs from Ghana have not yet been fully published. There's a suggestion, um, given a liquefied petroleum gas intervention that's cluster randomised, um, that there is a relationship between early life lung function and pneumonia, very unsurprising. But we don't yet have data on whether the intervention has improved anything at all. Which brings me to interventions are only interventions if they are interventions that are adopted. And half of the studies in the caps, half of the stoves in the caps at the end of one year were either not used or were broken. 
Um, and so the, this speaks to we need to have interventions that people understand, that people are able to adopt and to facilitate that. Second is there's many, many, many ways that you can make air quality bad. And I think focusing on cook stoves, as we've spoken earlier, is not uh, a useful paradigm. We need to think about all of the sources. We need to think about burning rubbish. You need to think about central Kampala uh, because the air quality must be bad. I haven't measured it yet. Um, and we need to think about smoking and all our other exposures. But we also shouldn't forget there's a world outside of lung health um, that there's very good reasons that we want to reduce particulate exposures. The opportunity costs of collecting firewood, the environmental degradation costs, climate change, and this is a photo from, uh, uh, from Malawi, uh, which I would contest is these floods were driven by uh, climate change. There's a lot of good reasons to do it. It's focusing on lung health is important if it's a tool that is used for action. And I think my last message is it's complex. I think the cook stoves didn't work partly because they weren't used, partly we might be measuring the wrong thing, um, and partly because it was a simple intervention. And we know that it's not that simple. We know that over the course of life, people develop acute infections. That's likely to happen, although immunisation is going to improve things considerably. We know that there's, con there's a considerable influence of malnutrition in utero and, and catch-up growth in early life. And we know another a number of important risk factors, including smoking, HIV, household air pollution and occupational exposures that drive declines in lung health. It's complicated, there's lots of factors. And in amongst all of that, there is a relationship where acute disease, pneumonia, look at the x-ray on the left, can develop into chronic lung disease. And chronic lung disease makes you more likely to have acute lung disease, and so there's the potential for it to interrupt that kind of cycle. It's not all that straightforward. Let's shift through here. <coughs> so there's many ways to make air quality bad and many ways to improve it. And you probably need to do multiple of these at the same time. You need to improve rubbish burning, not by high people's houses. You need to improve household air pollution, you need to improve lighting, use solar torches, you need to work on industry, you need to work on automobiles, you need to work on road surfaces. And I put this side up from the global burden of disease to say household air pollution is important. It's an important source of particulates to the poorest people and it, we need to do something about it. We need to do something that's accessible. One word of, um, uh, of perhaps Optimism is that as places get richer, as populations uh, improve on the uh, socio-demographic indices, household air pollution is less used. But it's not to say that household air, household air quality is necessarily going to get any better. If you look at the left, ambient air pollution doesn't, mostly driven through middle-income countries, each dot here represents a country, where countries are more, uh, are more wealthy, there's not quite the same relationship. Um, so we need to focus on air quality overall. And tobacco smoking, you need to do something about early on. And we talked a little bit yesterday with the uh, uh, Private Secretary for Health um, about the tobacco framework and its adoption in, in, in Uganda. So a personal view. I think household air pollution is bad, but I think there's ample evidence that particulate matter is bad. And I would contest that further research describing exactly how bad it is is probably not a useful uh, uh, enterprise. But the caveat being that multiple insults may unmask, unmask the underlying effect. Um, and that we need <coughs> intervention studies of health effects that work that people can adopt and are not based on a sim single principle just on cook stoves. And we should stop the wishful thinking about this. So that might feel a negative message about household air pollution, about air quality. I think it's positive. I think we need to recognise that there's a huge requirement for a call to action to improve air quality across the board and across the lifespan. Rebecca talked about Impala and the work uh, looking at in utero exposures. And that's important research because it might direct an intervention that's useful, either nutritionally or educationally. So there's lots of areas which we can work. I think we have to work cleverly, and I think we have to focus on areas where people can, tangible areas, like the Midwife Project, where you can make a difference.
but also that you can scale up to populations at large. I'm going to leave it there.